to welcome you to the show. Number I'm one. Happy to be here. And number two. Yeah. Every place I went to, I would hear jump, jump around, jump, and I go, "Wow!" <laughs> then I'd see you. Right. I would see you at the rainbow, and you had like this entourage. It was like I'd get ner- I get scared. I was like the geeky guy at the school, the school cafeteria. I go, "Oh wow!" Yeah. I learned that from Mickey Rourke. That entourage bullshit. You know what I mean? Way before there was a TV show. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to our playlist, Artist Rewind, your ultimate intimate conversation with your favorite artists. Also, if you enjoyed this episode tonight, follow us on Patreon. We have an all-access ultimate VIP backstage pass that's going to unlock unedited content that you might not see here. And the first Saturday of each month, we have a vinyl showdown where you bring your vinyl on our show and we're giving away vinyl just like this behind me you want it well you gotta be in it to win it all links are in the descriptions down below tonight the guest in the hot seat is danny boy of house of pain he's going to talk about what he's up to these days and he's going to talk a little bit about the old days but danny boy got a new house and it's from the movie the outsiders we're going to talk about that all on artist rewind Talking wax. Uh-huh. <laughs> you had the entourage, and and I was like, wow. And I remember Danny Boy. I remember seeing you out there hanging out by the about by the patio. And this is everybody. This is life before COVID. This is when we could <laughs> breathe on each other. It now be life before the internet as well. I mean, it, barely, you know. Cell phones, no, but yeah, life before the internet and definitely before COVID. Uh, <laughs> We're going uh, back. You're going back 30 years, which to me, 90s feel like a couple of years ago. You start talking 92, I'm thinking that wasn't that long ago. Not that long ago, man. Yeah. And it's like a whole nother world. You're I'm, born in Brooklyn. I'm right. born in Brooklyn. We probably know the same people from guys from Biohazard. Because of course, we toured I, together. We had a great, we had a great uh, relationship with Biohazard, and we went on the road with them, and uh, we went all over Europe with them. And which is odd because we would be bigger in certain areas, and then they were, we would get to Germany, and it was like, why are we open? Why are they opening for us? Because their presence there was massive. Uh, great dudes, can't say enough good things about them. But yes, we have a lot of things in common, and I'm thinking the pop culture thing is going to be the big one. And I don't care how jaded one gets uh, after living in LA long enough, but coming from New York, especially pre-internet, uh, and then diving into what is like Hollywood or the San Fernando yeah. Valley, all the yeah. stuff that everything you see on the TVs and the movies and the videos and then you hear about is all real and in real time. And you get to like stick your finger in that pie and, 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 you know, and it, it, it becomes a bit overwhelming. And uh, I started as a fan. I became mm-hmm. the act and mm-hmm. the greatest news in the world is I'm back to being a fan, which is a lot of weight off my shoulders. And we'll dig into that later, but I'm happy to tell you that it's a lot easier to appreciate the art sometimes than it is to be involved in them in the business of that. And it, 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 it's it's a lot, so yeah. Jumping, jump around. It was huge. Yep. You guys, it was big time. Yeah, we did okay. We, we, you know, it was at a time where like hip hop was starting to fall apart anyway. And, and, and so was rock music. And it, and it yeah. caught a second, you know, a second wind, us in Cypress Hill. Uh, kicks stuff off on the on the west coast and and then all the stuff that was coming out of seattle and 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 whatnot started with the grunge and and so all of a sudden here we are in the 90s and boom a whole new wave of what we already like is retooled and repurposed and put out there in in, in that way so we were fortunate i mean we, we brought a lot of bands out with us that are that ended up being way bigger than us uh and 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 to experience that at the time you know bringing Rage Against the Machine on their first tour, going out with Biohazard and Wool, which was an old punk band, uh, government issue that now a lot of those dudes were in Foo Fighters after that. And Mm -hmm. it was a very diverse group of people out there that all kind of, we were all kind of had that street mentality though, or that, 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 that we were, you know, we grew up in a, in a, we were the MTV kids. My man team, we're about to jump it off like this. It's the Irish is in the house. Yeah, the Irish is in the house. 
latchkey kids and the, yeah. and the creators and and it was a different vibe the 90s is a precious going through it I, it was it was the best times of my life and some of the worst times of my life but reflecting back on it now it really was special times yeah. hey, to be on si this uh, six feet above ground is better than being six feet yeah. below so I'm happy about that but what I'm trying to say is that we're the generation that grew up knowing what it's like not to have the the internet and the, and and that shit and then the first generation to adopt it and bring it into our world we're using as we speak we were before we went live we were talking about backgrounds and green screens and audio and all that stuff and so we know what we had the best of both worlds right we're enjoying the technology sometimes it's 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 a it's a nuisance and a distraction and it, it could be the devil at sometimes but it's also it provides connections that are not possible as when we were growing up yeah. but we I got just got to know Danny because I know I know you but I don't know you and I want to know like back you know I know you were born sure. in Brooklyn but when, yeah. when did you go to California I, what, so what I when I was two months old my father went to prison for a decade we were living in uh, Bensonhurst I was born at Maimonides Medical Center yeah. uh, we got evicted from that apartment so my mother moved in with my grandparents in Staten Island so I lived my first six years in Staten Island, uh, she got remarried and we moved about a mile away to the projects, Tyson Lane Projects. Yeah. Uh, and at six, we moved to California. My mother worked at Chase Manhattan Bank as a key punch operator back in the days. And she worked nights, so I really didn't know I had a mother. I thought my mother was kind of like a, a, a big sister and my grandparents were my parents. Uh, and key punch operating for those who are, you know, this, even to me, it's like the, the way computers used to be programmed, they were index cards. And in those cards, they had rectangles popped out of them and you would, for, you would run those through the computer and it would tell yeah. the computer what to do. So that was, uh, the if you wanted to be a programmer and you wanted to be into that industry, the best place to go was West. Uh, we ended up in um, Canoga Park, California, uh, San Fernando Valley when I was six. <clears throat> and that was the hotbed of the, the Cold War Star Wars program. So without doing a deep dive on that, my mother programmed guidance systems for to protect us against Russians. So I grew up, I came to Cali, I immediately felt like uh, Daniel Russo from The Karate Kid because I, I, I speak now better than you speak. <laughs> With, but when I got to LA, they were like, say quarter, I'm like quarter. They say water, I'm like water. And they're like, they're laughing at me. And then my mother had a wonderful taste in music. So I, I was I was raised on Motown really. And, and when I come to LA, it was like rock and roll or, or die. And yeah. so they used to call me Disco Dan. And those were fighting words, you know, I was like, you call me Disco Dan, I'll punch you in your mouth. But the truth <laughs> is, so I was like into disco and, 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 and R&B and, yeah. and I grew up in a roller rink, you know, I grew up in the skating rink. I was a latchkey yeah. kid. My mother was at work full time. My father was in prison full time. She had, my mother had kids that she didn't want and I was one of them. And so it was basically like, here's your key, don't disturb me. So I thought she was just being cool, but the truth be told, it was, it was that era. And I grew up in a place where 80% or more of the families that I knew were broken families. And it just was the, the norm. I didn't, yeah. you know, most people were living with their mom or, you know, part-time at their dad's. And this is the, the way it is. So by the time my head popped out and I realized, you know, we were different, this is around 13 or 14, seventh or eighth grade. I'm like, I got a tiger and you got an alligator. Like, damn, that alligator looks a lot better on you than these, they're laughing at my tiger. Yeah. And you start to get into that, you know, social economical thing where like kids from, uh, from the other side of town are sharing the same junior high as I am and they got all the stuff. And I'm like, where, what the, f yeah, I, ain't got all, yeah, I don't have all the right stuff. And it, you know, and that's around the time I see in the outside. <laughs> talk a, a, a about later <laughs> totally but that, totally, that yeah. thing changed my life too just seeing that because i thought if that's all it is if i could just find a gang of dudes that had my best interest and we run around with denim jackets uh, sneaking in the drive-ins uh, that'll be good enough for me but uh, a nice boy like you doing hanging around with that trash daddy's my buddy i'm a grease too we're all friends i'm sorry i didn't know but uh yeah growing up in the san fernando valley and then Oddly enough, my mother would send, she got the bright idea to uh, to export me back to the East Coast. By then, all the people that I had, all the family members left Staten Island and they did the natural progression, which is New Jersey. Uh, if you're a New Yorker, this is yeah. this joke's for you. They all ended up in, shocker, uh, Florida. Yeah. But that is the normal <laughs> snowbird uh, pro progression from any New Yorker. And I would go back to the East Coast every every, every summer. So I had a, you know, we were just talking about pre-internet and, and, and that kind of thing. I was pre-internet and bi-coastal. So I was growing up 
with like two different worlds that were happening simultaneously that unless you were older and well-traveled, you didn't understand those other worlds. So I, okay. I seen hip hop as it's starting to, to, you know, become a real thing and a force in, in music. And then I was also coming from LA, bringing like skateboard, surf, uh, Oingo Boingo and, and shit like Fishbone wow. to, to, you know, to the kids that I was running mm. around with. My tapes were different than their tapes. And I'm coming back with Curtis Blow, Houdini, Run DMC, and I'm talking a little different. I, you know, three months, is, you, you pick it up again. The, the, the walk, the talk. Yeah. And now they're saying, say quarter, say water. Like, oh, that shit again. I'm going to break. Again, you know what you, you said? Know? You know, because you speak better than me. <laughs> After this conversation, your lady's going to say, what the hell happened? You were speaking so good. You went on this guy's show. And Look you know, that's how it works, too. <laughs> that's how it, it works. It applies to British dudes when they go back and they come back. And all of a sudden, the, the, that Cockney accent kicks in. The brogue, yeah. if you're. Yeah, that's how it works. When, and so I had a, I, I had a very good childhood in the sense that I made the best of what I had. If you look at it from another lens, I didn't have a great childhood, but I, 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 I've been blessed with the ability to see the positive in most situations. And, and if I didn't, I would then tell you that it was a fucking shitty life because you know what I mean? But I made up for what I didn't get in other ways. Some not yeah. so good, some good, whatever but i feel like i've lived a charmed life and again i look back and think what a, what a way to grow up at a time when you know we the internet is the great equalizer you know and and anything you want could be at the uh, at the touch of your hands and that's a fantastic tool but it was a lot funner doing the scavenger hunt and totally. and, and being patient and looking for it and that goes for you know i miss punk per se by five years i'm 52 but if you were punk mm -hmm. Or if you were getting into hip hop, especially living in suburbia, you just there was no internet. You could just get the things. No, if you were in a punk, if you were in a punk, you had to go to you know, Reseda to Antennas, and that was the only barber shop that would do spikes and mohawks and manic panic in your hair. And you had to go to Hollywood to get the the spike belts from the rock shop and the 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 sex shop to get the bondage bracelets. And you had to go, you know, to this shop. You you really had to go all over the place to put the ensemble together, you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. And then you would wait till Friday, Saturday night to just trot it out there and see if they would, you know, you could find your tribe. And hip hop for me was that way because it was my generation's, you know, rebel music, if you will, yeah. you know, and and to find pumas and fat laces and name belt buckles and kangles and hoodies from Champion. And that was all, you just didn't find that in Sherman Oaks, California, no, Woodland Hills, Pumas, California. Man. That's you a found, Cadillac. Right. And you, you found them. And even if you found them, you didn't find purple and pink ones. No. Those were at Fox Hills Mall. Those were at the Sloss and Swap Meet. And you had to brave going there because you could get your shit handed to you being a white suburban kid totally. at a place. And so I learned to be tougher. Uh, being from New York made me tougher. Uh, you know, being Irish didn't hurt, and the, the family that I grew up in, you, everything was solved with violence. But uh, being in hip hop, you had to be tough back in those days. And that there was a handful of white kids that were, you know, that in Everlast, and you know, uh, it was one of them, and and a handful of dudes that I would see at all the spots. It was like there was a handful of us. We all knew each other, and it was like that was the that was the fun of it, though. That was the dangerous part of it. You know, I did enjoy some punk gigs as well. And they were dangerous as well. You know, you, you could get stabbed up and lumped up and just going there by other people even that weren't even going there. You know what I mean? And so I, I wouldn't trade that for anything. But, uh, you know, it, it is definitely uh, weird to, to reminisce and think, man, how the world has changed. I walk through the mall, not even the mall. I walk anywhere and you'll see kids with Ramon shirts that are three years old with faux hawks put yeah. up. And the, and I'm not knocking nobody if that's how you, 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 you know, you, you're showing the, your, your son or daughter. Uh, the cool shit, but boy, they used to spit at motherfuckers doing that shit back in the day and, and, and try something. to lump you up if you were, you know, if you were white and you dressed like you were a hip hop head, that could, that's problematic where I'm from. Yeah. And if you, if you're punk rock and you're not long hair, Hesher rock dude, you could get lumped up quickly because yeah. that was the status quo. So it was a sta you know, it's so funny you say this because I'm listening to you talk and back to, back in the day, even to have a tattoo like an 83, nobody really had it back then. If you had a tattoo, that was a state statement out there you know now i tell my wife i go i got all these tattoos and stuff i go i go but i yeah, go diminish the, the i go the, it the, took away the edge from uh, me of course you know yeah. you know and it, I, it, it took away because 
Charlie Manson said it the best. He said, uh, I was crazy when it, when it meant something to be crazy. <laughs> totally. <laughs> <And> that's <true>. Charlie. <laughs> give a look, give a look with your tattoos. You go, ah, man, yeah, now of it's course. A, you, right. It's my like a haircut to, you can't my change. My mouth to God's ears. I was telling the lady at the, the framing shop, I have a museum and I'm always in and out of the framers. And the lady, the girl, she said, oh, I like the tattoo on your finger. And I said, yeah, if I could do it over, I would, I would start a blank canvas. I'd probably leave it that way. She goes, really? I was like, someday you'll, you may know this. Home actor. from the movie The Outsides, 1983 right. movie that Francis Ford Coppola made for everybody out there. If you don't know, it was a book. And, and, and correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, I no, just I can screwed up you. The, no, you helped me. It was 1967 that book came out. I, I Absolutely, think. Yes. Yes. It was written by Essie Hinton, who is a female. A, a lot of times people go, I love all his work. And Essie Hinton is Susan Eloise <laughs> Hinton. Uh, it was encouraged the year after she wrote it to uh, maybe change her the way they you know, from calling it Susan Eloise Hilton, Hinton's book to Essie Hinton so that boys at seventh grade wouldn't get mad that a girl wrote a book that they were going to read because that's what the science was, mind-wise. They were like, nine nah, reading that. A girl wrote it, and she wrote it at 15 and a half failing English and got a D-plus in creative writing that year. So Wow. That'll, pretty, tell that, well, that'll tell you something. That'll tell you something, yeah. That, that's part of the reason why I'm so, you know, uh, so attached to it because there's hope in that you know what i mean i didn't i thought you had to be a mensa student and and valedictorian to even attempt something like that come to find out that she said i didn't let spelling or punctuation or grammar get in my way of telling my story and so that's wow. what she did and that's a that a girl wrote it, it, it with the, those grades at that time and it's never been out of print in uh 54 years and it sold more on the 50th anniversary than all the years combined What's fucking with that? <laughs> yeah, it, yeah, I mean, she had a series I mean, of books yeah. like Tex. Uh, yeah, you know, Tex, a bunch. Rumble, she followed Rumble with Rumblefish. She had a five years writer, writing, uh, writer's block after writing The Outsiders, as we can imagine. And then she wrote uh, a short story, which was uh, in the TU, which is Tulsa University's magazine called Nim The Nimrod. And uh, it, then it became a book, Rumblefish. And it was also Coppola picked it up and That's right. made a movie of that. And uh, never Ross, in a million years. Yeah. old man. And you'll exactly like your mother. And never in a million years that I think I'd be sitting in Tulsa, Oklahoma, uh, talking to you about this, but that's exactly what's Brooklyn. happening. That, now, when Outsiders came out, if it, it, for me, it was like almost like my Gone with the Wind, it, it, I, a place where I 100%. felt accepted, where, yeah. where like these guys who are misfits like me, who want to rebel, they're tougher than society. Think they know it all, but don't know it all. They're raised from their older brother. For anybody who's watching, has, have not seen it, you're under a rock read the book see the movie yeah. then you're gonna go in the links and check out danny's website we're gonna get to this no worries, but it yeah, was yeah. it was a place for us to feel accepted so like when, sure. when school junior high even goes hey read this they, they gave us i remember read i'm like i'm Absolutely. reading this but when i opened it up i was like wow yeah. stay gold on your shirt it's a so, it's a big yeah. quote a any, it's a, the any, bible for us yeah everything you're saying is is on point and and so i moved to la i go back and forth to new york i have really nothing uh i feel I have, I'm probably have a massive learning disability. I never studied at school. I saw the outsiders at 13 or 14, fell in love with that concept. Uh, I'm a pop culture junkie because again, I moved to LA at a time where like, you know, uh, Todd Bridges was our neighbor. He lived one block over from wow. different strokes and went wow. to our high school. And uh, Adam Rich from Eight Is Enough, would, I'd see him at the skating rink. And I grew up in a skating rink in the, in the, in the ice and, and roller. And uh, I get to high school and I, I really just hang out. I don't have any real life plan. I, unfortunately, I also saw Scarface somewhere around that time. And I, I, I mistook that as a documentary. And so I, I thought that that would be a good career. And so <laughs> hip hop, unfortunately, uh, does not shun drug selling yeah. <laughs> and gangster shit. No. And I was always fascinated with that stuff. And so never in a million years, even then, did I think I would we would end up starting a band and, and, and having any success. But that's exactly what happened. So we started House of Pain. I, I lingered around high school, although I never really went into the school. I, I went to Taft High School in the San Fernando Valley. Uh, and then around the time everybody was growing up, getting a, a job, getting a, uh, going off to college or getting, you know, their shit together, I was still out there floundering. So I started a band. Uh, Overnight, the band, we, we do gangbusters, Everlast Rights Jump Around, the biggest hit in hip hop history, yeah. uh, and we're off to the races. But what that does is really defer all of the conscious and the, 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 the consequences of living the way I was living prior to that, which again was I was doing a lot of credit card theft, drug selling, 
I'm not talking Scarface level, although I did Scarface was yeah. the, the the kind of the the blueprint. You know, some a little bit of coke, a little bit of weed, whatever, whatever. But I was always up to no good. So we do hip hop. We do we, we do hip hop. We are we're fucking we're b boys. But we we you know we made a we made three records. The 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 first one was so big that it was like a downward spiral slowly. Uh, by the time it's all over, I'm unemployed. The band's broken up. Uh, which is the same thing as being unemployed. I have no B plan because I thought this is what I'm doing forever. You know, what year was that shit. around? What ninety seven when... or eight around that time? Okay, yeah. And uh, you know, the house is getting foreclosed. The Ferrari is getting towed away. Wow. The, all of the Chrome Hearts shit doesn't fit anymore. And I, I now am mm -hmm. deep into a drug habit that used to. I people could say a lot of bad shit about me maybe back in the day, but one thing they couldn't say was that I was a fucking drug addict. And then would I become a fucking drug addict? Because that's, I put that out there on one side as, as a seller. So I, I reaped that back in my own life. So before long, I'm on methamphetamines. I'm on a real heavy downward spiral and it's all falling to pieces. And uh, I don't come up for air until about year 2000. Uh, I get sober. Uh, first year I do everything I'm supposed to do and, and, and my life starts to actually do a 180 and it starts looking good again. So year one, things go great. I do everything that's asked of me and I, and I, and I, and I work all 12 steps. Uh, I, I end up getting a solo record deal. Uh, they fucked around and gave me half a million dollars to start and that was where the ego starts to come back and the, you know, hip slick and sick guy starts to show up, which is me year two. I I'm still going to, 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 to my meetings and doing, you know, the bare minimum. And by year three, I thought, you know what, I'm good. I only had a drinking problem. I just got to stay clear of drugs. So I went out and had a drink and it lasted 72 hours before I was right back on methamphetamines. And that, uh, was followed by a two and a half year downward spiral until I was living in a warehouse, uh, on, uh, La Brea in Santa Monica, very few teeth in my mouth, warrant for my arrest, uh, suspended driver's license, uh, and basically everything I owned in a few boxes and bags. And it was that bad. And I never thought I was going to get it again. And uh, But I got willing as only the dying can be. And I had a window of opportunity. And one day somebody called me and said, I'm down the block if you ever want to go back to meetings. And that's what I did. And I've been successfully sober 16 and a half years, one day at a time. It is the best life I ever known. And uh, slowly but surely, I started to put my, th my things back together. And um, it was during that that I put another group together called La Coca Nostra, which ended up being all of the members of House of Pain. It didn't start that way, but it turned out that way. Uh, another group called Nonfiction and, uh, and an up and coming kid from Boston named Slain. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of buzz. We made a really good record. We, we, made, we made it. We may have waited too long to release that record because we were getting all kinds of deals dangled in front of us. Simultaneously, the, the music industry was falling apart. Um, and, and as consequently, now is basically done, <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah. But, yeah. Uh, and, you know, we went on tour and we went on tour in 2009. And in 2009, that brought me to Tulsa, Oklahoma. We had a three day layover here, which means it would have been cheaper to stay here than to go on to the next gig in, in Dallas. And it was during that three-day layover that it occurred to me that Tulsa rang a bell. And why it rang a bell was that, it, damn, I think The Outsiders was filmed here. And son of a bitch, I think the author's from here. And with that epiphany, I went out looking for those locations. And I was easily able to find the drive-in from the movie, which I'm ha happy to tell you it's still were, here. Were you just, just going to do like a little, like, uh, you know, I'm a fan. I just want to see. Are you a fan of, like, seeing different spots? Of course. Yeah, and yeah I, had, I had three days off. What am I doing in, a, in, a, in, in Tulsa, Oklahoma? So I yeah. thought, I'm just going to go look at these spots. At the time, too, technology was catching up with us. We lived, the world was changing real time. And what that means is that I had a flip phone still, yeah. a Razor. Yeah. I had a BlackBerry with like a one point nothing megapixel camera, which I thought was like the shit, right? And we had Facebook, Twitter, and MySpace. You get your own channel. MySpace, yeah. And now you're you're forced to kind of create a lot of content to get likes because we don't like likes, right? Mm -hmm. You know, I, I'm I'm as, as as fucked up as the next one. So <laughs> I end up going to the drive-in. I end up finding the park from the movie where uh, Johnny uh, saves pony uh by stabbing the socials and oh, that's cool. drown him leaf garrett and, yeah and, the rings man aren't these the greasers who uh tried to pick up on our women 
Hey, you're out of your territory now. You you guys better watch it. No, pal, you better watch it. Yeah. And by finding the park, I was able to find the house. And when I found the house, my mind exploded because there's a, there was a, you know, I'm a 40 something year old man, sober, highly caffeinated and just got a new, you know, camera. And I'm standing in front of what my 13 year old self re re recognizes as the Curtis brother home. And I just couldn't believe that it was one still on earth. And two, as I looked over, there was a for sale sign. It was $42,000 they wanted for the house. And I thought, this can't be true. Uh, at the time, I, I had to kind of walk away slowly from that. Um, and what I mean by that is like, you know, when, when, when one is sober, better not to jump in head first into the, into something impulsive, that you, get impulsive. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. Better run that by somebody. And I think I ran it by somebody and they're like, listen, you are not allowed to buy the world's coolest greaser for it in Tulsa, Oklahoma. You live in Beverly Hills. You have no idea uh, on any home improvement type of stuff. And really, if you, even if the house is 42 grand, you better have another hundred or so just to restore it, which I did not have at the time. So I kind of walked away, but I never forgot it. Because the what, home is built in, and correct me, it's, and I'm sorry to interrupt you. No, I'm, you I'm excited, it. so no, just no, tell no, me no, to no, shut no, up. You're good to but, go. But 1920, no. the home is built. Yeah, so it is. Old That's, home. It was, and it was, it was a trap house. And for those who don't understand what that is, it was, it was, it was, it was I wasn't, I'm not going to tell you they were selling actively. So it was, it was just an impoverished house with it had taken years of abuse and who knows what was going in there when I bought it, it mm -hmm. smelled to high heavens. It was like an episode of hoarding. Okay. And, but that took me five years and in between those finding it and the five years, I started a, a, a urban exploring. And what I mean by that is on that tour bus, it was the first time ever I'd been, first of all, I hadn't been a tour in a decade. Yeah. So now I got a new group we're on tour. We're on a tour bus and that tour bus now has internet access. It has a Wi-Fi router and I brought my laptop and my phone. So every time I pull into a city, I'm like, where was the Mary Tyler Moore show? We're in Minneapolis or where was Mickey Mantle buried? Oh, we're in Texas. Let's go to see. And so I started to go looking for these things. And now I'm putting that content on my Facebook page, people are like high fiving and going crazy. So I'm like, I'm on to something. People are loving the same pop culture shit that I love. And we couldn't have done that 10 years sooner. In the 90s, there was no way to find out all that stuff. You didn't have, you just, how, unless you knew somebody locally who knew where that was, how would you find that stuff? But now the internet is the great equalizer. We have the access to the world's largest library known to man. I mean, Kings yeah. didn't have this access a totally. couple hundred years ago. So, and now I got a telephone, uh, a VHR, a VCR. It's all the same. It's like my smartphone is everything. I got Magellan in my back pocket to tell me how to get there. I got the access to the world's largest library and I own my own stations, basically my own page on Facebook, Twitter. You could be I mean, like we, your own, you could be Lennon Nimoy in search I of mean, right here, right bro, here. And you, I, the theme song is going in my head as you say that. Jack Cousteau inspired me, Pippi Longstocking inspired me, ins expired me, inspired me and so did, and so did uh, Leonard Nimoy. I love those shows. Me too. I still watch those shows, bro. So, now it's the first time in human history that you can have all of those things line up. You have in your pocket, if you have a cell phone, you have everything you need. Okay. And I was like, I'm going to go find these things. So I started breaking down videos that I like. The uh, Clash, Rock the Casbah, it's filmed in, in Austin, Texas. Is the big, uh, is the, uh, the, What's the fucking the hamburgers shit? I don't even eat that shit anymore. Uh, Burger King is the Burger King there? Is the is the oil rigs there? Is the hotel? Yes, they're all there. I would found them, and then I do a mash before and after, and I put it on the internet. So it starts this whole thing, the Delta Bravo Urban Exploration Team, and I do that for about five years before I double back to Tulsa. Every year I, I would go through the U.S. and I would stop at Tulsa and look at the outsider's house. But at year five is when I started to get serious. And what I started to see was that the Habitat for Humanities was coming through and they were tearing down this side of the neighborhood to build newer homes, affordable homes for people who couldn't afford it. And by year five, they were one block away from the outsider's house. And it didn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that if I waited one more year, we would come back and it would be an empty lot. And so that's when I started to inquire about the house. Uh, long story even longer, I ended up paying $15,000 for the house. Uh, I believe that I stole it from the lady at that point since it's I bought nothing. it sight unseen. About it. Right. And then I broke in my own home and, and realized what I had bought. And it was a complete teardown. And uh, it was a fair it was a fair deal. And uh, yeah. I'm yeah. still friends with the old tenants. I paid them five grand to get relocate them in the next spot. And the lady who sold me the house is very happy that she gave it to someone who could actually do something to restore it and fix it and make it something that the community can enjoy. Now, they thank me everywhere I go in Tulsa. I'm like a mini celebrity. Uh, and it's very hard for me to accept the thanks because really all I did was buy the house. I put the I put the money up to do it. But this town 
these people, these fans, they built that house, man. I don't know the first thing about anything, but what I did know and what I, and I learned in sobriety, I learned to get out of my own way. I learned to humble myself and ask mm -hmm. for help. And when humble. you're a six foot six alpha male, it's hard to tell a motherfucker, hey, I don't know what you're talking about. He's calling it drywall. You're calling it sheetrock. What is this shit? Like yeah. I, I was easily confused by simple fixes. So I just got out of my own way. I said, guys, I don't know what I'm doing here. I got a leak in the roof and I think it's coming from the chimney and five different people would email me. Hey man, I'm in that business. Uh, after work, I'll come by and take a look at it. What would that cost me, sir? Oh, nothing for, we'd do it for the love of the outsiders, brother, stay gold. I'll be there at five. I'm like, Whoa. And we really? started fit. Oh, one after the other, this thing was, this thing gets built from the love of SC Hinton for the love of Tulsa, Oklahoma, for the love of greaserness and everybody who, who locally came through, Hey man, your grass is up to your hip and I'll come over there on Sunday after my daughter's soccer practice and we'll mow your lawn. Now lawn gets mowed from a local company who just wants to do wow. it. Wow! You know, the bug sprayers come once a month to spray for any kind of uh, pesticides for bugs and, and, and rodents once a month. I said, where's my bill? We ain't charging you a bill. We're doing it for the love. Stay gold. And so this thing became a, became a communal project and it, 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 it changed my life because I, didn't, I don't know that I would have saw that kind of love in L.A. And I wouldn't see it in New York either. And that's not a knock on either coast. It's just we got it's almost like a Shawshank Redemption shit where like the yeah. world got itself in a big old hurry. In L.A., we're just too busy. We're too busy being busy. Busy. Yeah. And nobody got no time for that shit. Here they had the time, they had the, the motivation, and they were thankful that somebody came from a coastal city to remind them what a great city that this city is. And so after going back and forth that year, working on this project, I got back to L.A. one day and I was like, why am I keep coming back here? I belong in Tulsa. And so I've been here ooh, uh, a little over four years, wow. which feels like I just moved here a month or so ago. Uh, that's a good thing because I, I and I've watched a city. A uh, formerly great city. This is the oil capital of the world. There used yeah. to be so much money here. You didn't know what to do with it. Uh, and it's having its revival right now. And I, I feel like the smartest guy who's ever left L.A. to come to Tulsa because I came, again, four years ago. Uh, you can yeah. have a, a beautiful, yeah. authentic life in the heartland, uh, similar to what your parents or your grandparents enjoyed in the, in the 50s and 60s anywhere USA. It is nice people, affordable homes. Yeah. Uh, we have the longest rideable stretch of Route 66 road left. We have drive-in movie theaters. We have historic movie theaters. I love that, man. The drive-in movie theaters. It's That's the like, best. It's so, you know what? Listening to you talk, I'm, I'm, I, you're you trying know, to move I, to Tulsa, huh? Yeah, yeah. Well, I want to <laughs> well, just got to come and I'll show you, you know. But uh, my point is, is that, you know, in L.A., I had, a, I had got to a point where I was long term sober. Yeah, yeah. I, had, I got a couple things back, you know, the outside shit that doesn't fit. But I had a nice, you know, old car and a motorcycle yeah. and I ran around with Steve Jones and, 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 and Slim Jim and a lot of sober friends. And life was good. But if I'm looking and I'm being honest, I was really just treading water because I had no purpose there. I wasn't, my purpose was not to bring hip hop music to the masses. Nobody needs that shit from me. They got enough of it, right? And that's, in the past, I was only about feeling what I needed, you know? Yeah. And this thing, unbeknownst to me, I just saw an opportunity and I couldn't imagine that world without the outsider's house. So that's why I bought it. I was all in when I bought it too. I had 28 grand in my name and no work in front of me and no foreseeable work in front of me. Mm -hmm. I literally applied to a graffiti removal job in Culver City to show myself that I'm willing to go to any length to stay sober, even if that means taking a job, uh, because I figured how fucking smart you got to be to remove graffiti. Uh, I can do, wear a dicky suit and drive a white van, totally. the city behind where I live in Beverly Hills, in Culver City, and do that on the low and not feel bad about myself. I was, I, I was trying to get a job either in the parks or graffiti removal just because I'm spraying paint. I'm just doing my thing. I don't give a fuck. Uh, and when I got willing, this thing opened up, right? Wow. So I ended up buying the house. It, 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 we crowdfunded it. Uh, the author is the number one uh, supporter of it. She's in 35,000. Jack White gave me 30,000 after playing the, the baseball stadium downtown. He's like, I'm a fan. I'm going to come over. We started talking. He's like, where are you at? What are your numbers? I was clear and concise. I knew my, my shit and I knew what I was saying. And he said, I believe it. And this looks good. I want to see it done. And he got me the, he gave me the 30 grand. That was the, that was the last 30 we needed to get this done. And then all the other money came in from everyday folks who, who were not only giving what they could financially, but a lot of it was gift in kind. Like I said, mowing the lawn, fixing the, 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 the leak in the roof, redoing the roof. Any type of 
restoration stuff, people just jumped at the opportunity. And if they charge me, they charge me only the cost of labor or no, no labor, only the cost of materials. It was miraculous to see. And it changed my life. And what I, when I said I had a purpose for once I could see my purpose, there were hard days, man. And there were stray cats and stray dogs. And then my mind was telling me, dude, shut the fuck mm. up, feed those dogs, go to the dollar store, get some food, feed them and go home, put your head down. You're sober. You push it. You just go to tomorrow. And sometimes that's what got me through. But what I realized my purpose was here to make sure that this museum and this house stays that kids and families get to enjoy it. That's my number one client. When I get people to come to this house, it's the, the whole family tree. I had a guy there yesterday, 91 years old. He's a c train conductor, or he played a conductor in the cut scenes from the outsiders who come by and give us hour long story and signed our wall. Uh, but what I'm getting, I don't want to go down and off the- No, go, path. man, go. My, my no. thing is, is this, it provided a purpose. And that is the most fulfilling thing that I think any man or woman can have is, a purpose. And my purpose, like I said, is to make sure that this house is the best it can be and that it's open and available at all as much as possible to serve the community at large. And what that does is it shows people that a girl who was 15 and a half failing English with a D plus in creative writing can change the world. And she did just that. And it's my job to make sure that, you know, the house is clean, that it's well staffed and that we can provide, like I said, that, that kind of educational slash pop culture uh, experience to anybody traveling or even locally. And that's what exactly what we do. And that's been the difference maker. And if I never get a lot of money doing this, I'm already overpaid. I'm the richest guy I know, and it has nothing to do with money. It has everything to do with the purpose. I want to thank Danny Boy for sharing his stories with us. And if you want to find more about the home of the outside is all links will be in our descriptions down below until then, everybody we'll see you next week, 8 PM Pacific standard time, Saturday night. Remember it's only rock and roll and we like it. I'll see you then. Bam. <laughs>I was going to let you off that easy and go check out some other past episodes, maybe something here or something there. And don't forget to subscribe right over there. We'll see you then. Who loves your baby? We do.